What I'm going to talk about today is intelligent machines are different from what we've thought about before. We're, already, we're used to these, these sorts of intelligent machines. But once intelligent machines have ability to act in the world, the sorts of things we're talking about here at Solid, uh, how we're going to interact with them, how we're going to be with them is different, and it's going to be scary for a lot of people as these machines come online, as, so as hardware and software come together. Um, we've had robots around, electronic robots, for over a century now. Uh, that the first one that I can find is from 1912, an electronic uh, dog that followed lights around. On the right is Gray Walter's 1948 tortoises. There was a series of articles in Scientific American in 1948, 1949. These, this was a robot that had lots and lots of different behaviors, all out of two vacuum tubes. And the nonlinearities in vacuum tubes was how he got those different behaviors. But these clearly weren't programmed. They had a set of fixed behaviors. And then robots in people's minds started to come about in 1961 with the Unimation robot, the Unimate on the left there. But that was back when a computer was still going to fill this stage. So they started without computation. They used ladder logic and fixed sort of uh, program sequences to do the same sorts of tasks again and again. And in fact, the vast majority of robots, industrial robots out in the world today, sort of suffer from that, from that uh, from starting out that way. So you buy a, a robot up there on the right, it's got a big control box, then you have to buy a safety system for it, then you have to buy sensors for it, you put them together, and to us that sounds fun. Um, and then you've got this impenetrable user interface up in the top left corner. But it, industrial robots today are sort of like you buy a chassis, you buy a drivetrain, you buy the airbags, oh, and none of the code is written for any of the microprocessors. You can't just buy a car. Um, so we, our machines that we've had with physical extent, our robots, have not been very intelligent as a result. Um, and in fact, most robots today are, look like those on the left, no people around, they're doing the same thing again and again. There's, there, there, there's a distinct line between people and robots. And the sorts of technologies we're talking about here today have people and robots together doing the much more fuzzy sorts of things that we expect to happen as they're on the right. So um, this is what uh, robots in factories look like. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a, an inferno. You don't want to go in there. And in fact, if you do go in there, the whole line shuts down. Um, but then uh, we've started to see in the last 10 or 12 years, new sorts of robots that interact with people. This is the Roomba, which uh, iRobot brought out in 2002. Um, again, though, it's pre-programmed. Its behavior doesn't change over time. You buy the robot, the software comes with the robot, and that's what you've got. Uh, in my current company, we've been trying to build a new sort of robot for factories. Uh, we call it Baxter. And the difference here is that it's able to interact closely with people. It's safe to interact with. But more importantly, it's not just the hardware. It's the hardware and the software. And the software changes every few months and changes the behavior of the machine. Now, we've all sort of all got, gotten used to that. That's what I'll, I'll just show you here. People and robots working closely together, um, doing some, some tasks there. By the way, most of our customers go off and 3D print the fingers for the robot. So 3D printers and flexible robots are sort of coming together naturally there. Um, and, and we see other robots and people working together, such as Kiva, uh, the Kiva robot that Amazon uh, bought uh, two years ago, and where the robots move the shelves to the person so the person doesn't have to run from shelf to shelf. I think, think we're going to see this blending of people and machines working together, integrated workforce, uh, over the next few years in a way we haven't seen before people and machines with physical extent that move around in the world and that are safe to be close to. But in our IT world, we've changed the way we think about products from our physical world. The car on the right, you buy it, it works one way, and it works that way forever and ever, as long as you maintain it. The thing on the left, you buy it, and then when you up download the new software a few months later, it changes its behavior. It sometimes performs a whole lot better. It starts speaking to you with one new release of software. It didn't speak to you before. Um, so it gets new capabilities and becomes more intelligent. 
And we're sort of okay with that. We've gotten used to our IT systems being different from day to day. We don't get upset that I did a search one day and got one set of results. I do the same search three months later, I get a different set of results. We know that it's a dynamic world out there that our, our software is, in, is, uh, is uh, interacting with. So we expect variations in, in, in our software systems. But to a large extent, we sort of expect our physical devices that we interact with to work the same way. You know, you don't expect a software upgrade to your car to change, you know, the, the, the accelerator is now on the left rather than on the right. That would be pretty, pretty bizarre. And people get pretty angry about that. Um, so uh, what's going to happen as, as, as software changes our machines? And it can change it quite profoundly. This is a, I'm sorry for the, 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 the uh, size of this video, but this was um, a, a, a master's project done by a student, Adam Kumpf, I don't know if Adam is here today, back in 2006, where I challenged him to build a compliant robot arm for less than $100, including the Unix system driving it. I think he used the gum sticks, he used uh, old mo uh, motors out of uh, windscreen wipers, he got the elastic element by using fishing line as the tendons, and then he had software which was doing a bunch of things. Software was modeling the hysteresis in the system, software was modeling the backlash in the gears, and software was crunching down around the zero point of sensors, so that together, this system, which cost almost nothing, had great physical performance. It can compliantly now apply paint to a surface that didn't know where that surface was, didn't know the shape of the surface, but it's feeling, measuring forces and doing what you would do as you do painting, not position control, but force control. But the beauty here was, it was the software interacting with the physical system and making the physical system better at doing a task than trying to build a pure hardware system. And so one aspect of our new software Oh, I didn't, yeah, we can go back for a second. One aspect of our new software is that, uh, our new physical systems is the software improves their performance. But then software also prevents an, presents an interface to people of how the, how the, uh, the uh, machine, the physical machine, physically interacts with you. And sometimes we like our dumb droids, which don't have much initiative, and sometimes Maybe our machines have a little too much initiative. Um, and we are starting to get a, a fine line there, and I'm actually seeing that with, with real customers who say, I don't want that machine to be that smart. I like having a dumb machine. So I'm going to show you a little video of these two aspects, software improving performance, and then intelligent machines, maybe in the physical world, making some people a little uncomfortable. So first, I, I just want to show you um, with us, this is Baxter, Baxter's here. Um, you can go play with Baxter. This is Baxter, same physical hardware with a software release 12 months apart. Um, and the improvement in performance is, is pretty good. Uh, by the time we're 50 seconds into this task, we're uh, one and a half times as far along in the part count. As we get towards the end of this task, the robot on the right with the newer software finishes the whole task um, in about a minute, 33 seconds. Whereas the robot with the software from a year ago uh, took uh, over three minutes to finish the task. So there you see that same sort of better modeling of hysteresis, better modeling of physics, making the machine better. And then intelligence is a, is a good thing. We like our machines to be intelligent. Here I'm training the robot to pick up a part, and I open the fingers, and it feels a force, and so it makes an inference. Oh. He must have wanted me to pick up something, and I pick that part up by opening my fingers. Don't have to go to a menu and say, we're going to do a pickup, or oh, we're going to do a pickup by opening fingers. Here I come, and I go and just grab something from, by closing fingers, and it makes a similar sort of inference. I could have a menu-based system to do this, but it's sort of easier if the robot is smart enough to make those inferences of how I want to do the task. But that's, that's, that's OK, a smart interface. But then when robots start to have initiative, sometimes the customers don't like that so much. So here's a, here's a, um, uh, a task picking things up of a conveyor belt. This is a common sort of thing many of our customers have happen. Parts come out of a plastics machine. The, the, uh, the um, 
robot notices the parts. It doesn't need to know the velocity of the, of the conveyor ahead of time. It matches it, goes, picks it up. But then we put lots of little pieces of intelligence and little pieces of common sense. So it's picked up this part. It's going to put it down. And now it drops it. It doesn't go and try and put the part down you know, that it dropped. It realizes, oh, I don't have a part in my hand anymore. I should go get another one. Some of our customers hate that. They hate having a machine that doesn't do the same thing again and again. People still think of machines like cars. They should act the same every time. They should do the same thing every time. We're here trying to make machines that don't act the same all the time, that have intelligence. And we sort of think everyone's going to want that. But I think it's going to be a while before everyone, before, the, before more than the early adopters get used to that. So I'm just going to finish up. People ask me often, um, OK, I'm building robots. I'm doing research on robots. What should I do research on? What's going to make our robots better? And I like to think about the following four things as being something that, although you know, we've got these physical modules, we know how to program them, there's some other stuff that are going to make our robots way, way better and give them much more initiative and give people much more heartburn about them. First thing that we're not there yet with is the visual object recognition capabilities of a two-year-old child. Computer vision has got fantastically better in the last 10 years. Moore's law has been very, very good to it. But we, we don't recognize categories the same way a two-year-old child is good at recognizing categories. We recognize image of same thing. So object recognition capabilities of a two-year-old child. If you can make robots do that more like that, they're going to get much better. Um, the language capabilities of a four-year-old child. Four-year-old children can hear in very noisy domains, whereas your Siri can't. They can handle accents. They can handle grammar. They maybe don't have great vocabulary. They learn vocabulary very quickly. But they're much better at understanding language than any of our current systems are. Two-year-old vision, four-year-old language, six-year-old um, dexterity. A six-year-old child can tie shoelaces. A six-year-old child can do fine motor manipulation. A six-year-old child can do every single thing a factory worker in China does in terms of manipulation. Our robots right now are pathetic at dexterous manipulation. They're parallel jaw grippers. They don't have anything like the sensors, the materials, and the computation that we engage with with our hands. Last thing, two, four, six, eight, um, the social understanding of an eight-year-old child. If we're interacting with a robot, we would like it to know what we know, understand what we've just learned, and be able to have a model of what it is we know. You know, one of the worst things to me is every time I go with my, to an ATM machine, every day for the last five years, it said, do you want to speak Spanish today? No, stop asking that stupid question. It should have an understanding of who I am, what I know, and who knows what, and then let us um, interact with it in a much more natural way so that the machines of the future that have initiative are not so scary to us. Thanks very much for your attention.